Hi friends, um, we are at part two of um, Forge. So I'm gonna read the first chapter in part two, which is chapter 14. All right. This is a quote from George Washington writing from Valley Forge to Continental Congress, President Henry Lawrence, Henry Lawrence. Um, forgot the date, Sunday, December 21st, 1777. He says, what then is to become of the army this winter? I whistled as we trudged along the muddy road. Yes, I was hungry, foot sore, tired and cold but it mattered not for we were a few hours away from the winter encampment. How can you be in such, a good, in such good humor? Greenlaw asked. Eben, walking a few paces ahead alongside his distant cousins and Burns glanced back, but he quickly turned around when I stared at him. We had been avoiding each other ever since Kingston. I was in Morristown last winter, I said. This was the truth. With the army, a half truth. We had a grand time, falsehood. Did you have parties? Benjamin Edwards asked, with ladies who like to dance and drink punch. This caused much hooting and laughter and shoving of poor Edwards' form. He protested loudly until he stopped. No dancing or punch, but we had regular rations, I said once we were again underway, and there was plenty of firewood, and a commissary with fresh clothes and blankets. All true, though Isabel and I partook of none of it, as we had no proper ties to the army. Everyone groaned with pleasure at the notion. Our blankets had been worn bare since Saratoga and our clothes had not fared better. I wore the shirt I stole off the red coat. My own shirt had been reduced to the rags that I wore around my hands and neck. Eben's only shirt had barely survived the washerwoman of Albany. Luke Greenlaw hadn't worn sock stockings for weeks and his coat was worn through at both elbows. Both of the Janik twins wrapped scarves over their heads on cold mornings for their hats had been stolen one night in an Albany tavern. The shoes of old man Sylvanus were made more of dirt than leather. He felt it necessary to remind of us, this of us, remind us of this every day. We were a filthy pack of tatterdemalions. Greenlaw picked a bug crawling along his sleeve. I can't figure out how the officers are going to fill our hours. Won't be any fighting. General Washington might as well send us home till spring. We could come back after Easter, thrash the British, and return home in time to plant the corn. Ha! exclaimed Sylvanus. His excellency is no fool. He'll keep us busy a marching and a drilling, because if we left for home, he might never see us again. The fellows at Morristown kept busy, I said. They made musket balls, repaired guns, rolled cartridges. They had more to do than ours to do it in. What was your role? asked Greenlaw. Advisor to General Washington on the proper method of stone throwing? I waited for the laughter to die down. I had, in fact, once served General Washington a dinner of steak and kidney pie at my master's house in New York, but they would never believe that. I worked with a blacksmith, I said, which was both true and believable. Warmest job in the entire camp. I'll wager you right now I'll get to do it again. Blacksmiths don't want clumsy oafs helping them in the forge. They need skilled chaps like me. I stumbled upon a new thought and near tripped over a rut in the road. In Morristown, some of the officers had hired privates to be their manservants for the winter. I was well suited to the task and it would be less work and more comfort than working the bellows and breathing charcoal fumes at a blacksmith's. Once I got my bearings in Valley Forge, I'd make inquiries. I have no use for epoxy blacksmiths or generals, for epoxy blacksmiths or generals advisors, grumbled Sylvanus. I need a cobbler before my shoes lie down and die. I'd be content with a cook, Greenlaw said. The sun was in the west by the time we made our way up the winding road to the encampment. We passed by a first, then a second set of guards and were directed to a road that branched away from the river. All of us had fallen quiet. The sunset burned red, a coal buried deep in ash. Darkness fell a mile later. We passed campfires ringed by tired looking fellows warming their hands, tents pitched like sagging ghosts behind them. There was little talk, no laughter. On the far side of a muddy field stood a collection of large marquee tents fashioned for high ranking officers, 
with room for proper furniture like beds and tables and chairs. Shadows moved inside them. We removed our muskets, tents, and cook kettles from the wagon, then watched as the sergeant drove it into the darkness, taking with him Burns and Eben to help with the unloading of the beef barrels. He told us to wait whilst the cap captain reported to the general staff. The first stars shone overhead. Thought you said there'd be food, Greenlaw groused at me, groused at me. The sergeant will bring back our rations, I said, still pretending to be an authority on winter encampments. We fell quiet enough to hear the voices in the officers' tents, as well as loud voices in the distance. Then Sergeant Woodruff and other Massachusetts offer, another Massachusetts officer ran past us without a word, straight to the tent that the captain had entered. That don't bode well, muttered Sylvanus. Shadows in the tent rushed to and fro like puppets on a stage. And then there came all manner of shouting and foul explosions of language. What are they carrying on about, Sylvanus asked. The sergeants burst out of the tent, putting an end to our palaver. Follow me, spat Sergeant Woodruff. Not a word. We tripped our way across a flat field in the darkness until we neared campfires bright enough to show a long line of cannons. The air smelled of burning wood, but not of roasting meat or bread. Fellows round their fires were uncommonly quiet. Sergeant Woodruff halted. Gather round, he said low. We formed a circle around him. Eben and Burns had caught up with us, but stood a few paces away. The blasted meat is spoilt, the sergeant said. Every bite of it. A few fellows groaned. Sergeant Woodruff dropped his voice to a whisper. The brine didn't have enough salt in it. Likely a British trick. They've been paying merchants to sell us spoiled goods, according to the officers. Some flowers do arrive from Reading in the morning. That will tide us over. Greenlaw could not keep quiet. We haven't eaten all day, sir. The sergeant raised his hands in warning. Most of the soldiers here haven't eaten for two days. I smell food by the officer's tents, Greenlaw protested. Surely they should share it. The sergeant pointed at him. That is the last word out of you on that subject, Private Greenlaw. Officers get fed first and best, and that's the way of the army, and you shall not question it. Greenlaw breathed hard, but bit back his reply. Most of the 16th Massachusetts will be sent to forage tomorrow. Our company has been attached to 4th New Hampshire. We'll camp with them in the morning. Tonight, you'll pitch your tents near those. He pointed toward the shadows beyond the firelight with the artillery. Uncle, Eben asked softly, wouldn't it be better to find the New Hampshire barracks tonight? There are no barracks. The sergeant rubbed the back of his neck. Not yet. His Excellency General Washington has ordered the army to manufacture a city of flogs. Each squad is building themselves a cabin, only he calls them huts, the way they do in Virginia. Where do we sleep until the hut is finished? Sylvanus asked. In your tents, the sergeant answered bluntly, which you will now pitch. This is madness, Burns muttered. Much as I loathed him, I agreed. We fumbled with stiff fingers to put up the tents in the dark, but it was impossible. At last, we laid the canvas on the ground and laid ourselves upon it. I was forced to sleep at the edge which one side next to, with one side next to Eben and the other exposed to the night air. I wiggled until my back no longer touched his, then pulled up my collar, pulled down my hat, and tried to warm myself with thoughts of blazing bonfires and buckets of hot tea. Brown coughed without cease until Sylvanus cursed at him. After that, he coughed with his face buried in his arms. Above his cough, I heard owls, the wind, and chant echoing from campfire to campfire. No meat. Thousands of hungry soldiers took up the cry, no meat, no meat, no meat, no meat. All right, that is chapter 14. Um, please go back and listen and reread parts of the chapter or the whole chapter multiple times and uh, make sure you finish those high quality jots that will lead to high quality book club conversations. Thank you for listening.